On April 26, 1999, three words changed a generation. Super Smash Brothers! For millions of people, Smash was and continues to be an iconic game that defined their childhood. While some would express their dedication by competing to become the best players, others would grow to become artists, programmers, and game designers, all sharing their passion projects through a new and thriving online ecosystem. But as time progressed, Smash would change, as would Nintendo's stance on what the game should be. Super Smash Bros. Brawl marked a turning point where a decision was made to emphasize being a casual party game to play with your friends. And while this was fine for most people, many of those previously dedicated players were left with a demand for a game that captured the spirit of what they grew up with. Platform fighters released throughout the 2000s and early 2010s needed a way to distinguish themselves from Smash, and so the early days of the genre were highly experimental. And while some games have maintained a cult following, broadly speaking, players were unsatisfied. As the technology to create and share games became more accessible, an influx of fan games based on Smash emerged. While some added new characters or tweaked existing mechanics, the genre's core gameplay loop began to solidify. But perhaps even more important, these fan projects made it clear that a foundation of responsive, combo-centric, and expressive gameplay was essential for the genre to shine. With Brawl failing to offer this foundation, in 2011, a group of developers released a mod called Project M. The M is short for Melee, PM transformed Brawl's slow and floaty gameplay into a fast-paced fighter fitting its namesake and Nintendo was not happy. With the mod team under constant legal threat, development on PM ceased in 2015. But despite Nintendo using their influence to shut things down, the widespread popularity of PM and fan games was a green light for aspiring developers to take the leap on making their own titles. The last decade has seen a surge in new IPs pushing the genre beyond its early identity of Smash clones and ushering us in to a platform fighter renaissance. Hi, I'm Dan Fernacy. My name is Thaddeus Cruz. We're Punkzilla. That's uh, that's the name of the team. My name's uh, Adam Jones, but most people know me as Taza. I'm Cordell Felix. I'm the president and game director. I am the studio lead at Ether Studios. Yeah, I'm Tim. I'm the development director. Character designer and programmer for Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. I am a producer at Blue Mammoth Games. Well, these developers may all occupy the same space, the paths they took towards working on platform fighters are vastly different. For myself, I've been working in the game industry for indie games, then I worked on um, God of War, Bioshock, and then I watched the, the Smash documentary. They mentioned uh, Project M, and I'll, I remember them like showing little clips of it. I was like, what the hell is Project M? And like, I just like fell in love with it. And then I was like, I need to be part of this. Like I, I do 3D modeling and I just want to do an art test for us. So I did an art test. I did the fierce deity sword for Project M. And then they're like, yeah, all right, you got the job. My roots are with Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Met the community that I played with there. Uh, first tournament that I, first major that I went to was Apex 2014. And then after that, I became so involved in the platform fighting scene that I basically just played any platform fighter that there was that had all the way back to grade school, elementary school, I stumbled upon a program called Game Maker. So I kind of taught myself that just through Google, kept trying to make, you know, arcade games, games that I liked. Maps 1 was my first, like, really big involvement with the game. Slap City, I was involved with it, but it was initially to a lesser extent. I was in more of a community management position. Later on, that expanded to actually contributing to the game itself somehow i still don't know how that happened in 2001 a game called super smash brothers melee came out uh got a little obsessed with that then all my hobby games kind of turned into trying to make smash bros in game maker regardless of how much experience you have trying to break into a seemingly monopolized genre is a daunting task but if there's one thing these games have shown it's that there's a growing audience looking for new ways to play but before we go any further, to support the channel and make sure we can keep making awesome content, leave a like, subscribe, and let us know in the comments what game you'd like us to cover in the future. Going to Brawlhalla, I was like, oh, this is a platform fighter that is different. And, and that's what makes it so interesting and so exciting for me to be involved in. And I think the thing that really kept me uh, going was when I went, oh, this game's awesome. I see the potential but nobody's doing it what I see the grassroots scene of Smash is doing. And so I was like, yeah, I'll just try this for fun. And then when I started doing it, it really took off. That was where I was just kind of like, okay, I'm just staying with this game, this is amazing. Very similar to what we saw in Rivals of Ether as well. We were able to keep a small team together until we honestly launched Steam Workshop. 
and then we were able to afford the team that is developing Rivals 2, right? Um, Workshop really enabled that for us. And I think for a lot of the team, they grew up on games like 64, Melee, and then Brawl came out. So being introduced to this and then being asked to like add in uh, more mechanics and systems that are going to distinguish this game from other games, I had to like process like all this Smash information through my FGC brain and then kind of like work with everybody to make sense of it. Everybody on the dev team knew that the game was going to pop off, I think more than the publishers were expecting. Nobody expected it to the extent that it did. Nobody saw it coming. This is where we run into a problem. While the general reaction to new platform fighters has been positive, it's also been fleeting. With few exceptions, there's been a recurring trend of platform fighters releasing with massive hype behind them, only to fizzle out in the following months as they struggle to retain a player base. This kind of drop-off is common in the modern gaming industry, but platform fighters in particular have faced growing pains as they attempt to establish their own identity. I do think it's a pretty hard genre to develop for. A lot of our studios, they are good at combat, but it's like kind of specific forms of combat. I think like, you know, Smash has definitely showed compared to every other game, just the game feel and the way it plays is uh, really good, it turns out. So if you're challenging Smash, you have to be at least at least really good in, in game design and game feel. With many of these devs coming from a competitive Smash background, the focus on refining combat and introducing new gameplay mechanics was a natural first step. Gravity Cancel defines Brawl. Uh, 100%. The ability to use grounded moves in the air in exchange for your defensive option to extend combos, strings, and possibly get punishes makes Brahalla one of the most unique experiences ever. I think gravity canceling is like one of those, whoa, I never would have thought of that because who's going to use a grounded down tilt to, to like extend a string in the air? The biggest one, the most obvious one, is the slide meter. That was something that was decided on and locked in from the very beginning. It wasn't a, it was not a tacked on feature. It was not something that we scrambled with later trying to make it work. It was very much the like focal point of the design from the very beginning. Tim brought this different aspect to it. And this guy, you know, is, is this bleeding blood for, for Street Fighter, just all, all traditional fighting games. So he brought this different aspect to the team, like on hit cancels and like Magic series, all stuff. I remember back in the day, you like, you would say like, oh, let's do magic series. And like, I, was, I don't know what that is. Smash attacks, I know what that is. So we worked really well as a team. As a team, we figured out how to make those mechanics uh, work for this genre, which is like really hard, hard, much harder than you think it is because you have to have the design brain to like to do it and make it feel good in your game and for it to make sense. So I truly do feel like in our game, it just feels natural. And that's the response we've been getting. If you look at any kind of indie game, that has succeeded in the last, you know, <clears throat> 10 years or so. You look at something like Stardew Valley and you see that um, Concerned Ape was really able to get to the core of like, what do people like about a game like Harvest Moon? And how do you kind of expand upon that and grow it? That's something that we felt that we do as well in um, Rivals of Ether. And then the same thing when I go to Smash now, like I played Ultimate, I tried to do a ledge special. Like I tried to hit the B button at ledge, it didn't do anything. And I was like, oh, right. like. This isn't in there. All of this is amazing if you're a hardcore gamer who loves the intricacies of what makes each game unique, but most people aren't like that. Most people really are just looking for something fun to pick up and play with their friends, especially when they're given that expectation from the leading title in the genre. Developers have been caught in a balancing act in their desire to appeal to a niche competitive audience while still offering enough fun, casual content that anyone can enjoy. And ever since the COVID era of things, people are doing a strategy of, out the gate, lots of money sponsored streamers make the game numbers look fantastic. Say, whoa, this is going to be the next XX, whatever. And then a month later, it, it, it uh, the player base drops because the money is not not being pumped into it anymore. And then everybody screams dead game and then the game goes away. This is not just an NPC thing. This is an industry wide thing. Overemphasizing competitive gameplay and investing in esports early on can lead to an explosive release but it can also lead to an unsatisfied broader player base. Well, this has been a painful lesson to learn, it's one that platform fighters have taken to heart. Esports to be done well, it has to be like grassroots and then up, right? It's really hard and so expensive to try to do esports big from the beginning and also do it in a way where it's like super controlled and kind of diagnosed. Um, I think we saw it a little bit with Overwatch League. Um, where, you know, obviously Overwatch, super awesome game, great competition, but having Blizzard come in and kind of try to set up that massive league right out the gate with the team buy-ins 
um, it's just so much risk and so much money, right? Like only the biggest companies can get involved. I think that is actually what's been stopping everything from having a chance. I think that's what kind of sets the hall apart is that like it just had some time to gauge interest and the developers paid very close attention. We constantly made changes to the game based on what we thought people uh, were having fun with. Games like uh, Street Fighter V when it launched and Multiverses as well, they had a lot of issues with the player base because of the casual content was just lacking. There wasn't anything for like new players to do. Multiverses has that Warner Brothers backing and they can put in a lot of money for these uh, big tournaments. And Nickelodeon as well has the publisher, Game Mill, as well as Nickelodeon. And for other games like Rivals or Us or like Frame Makers, it is a lot more difficult to kind of have this like big financial support to these players who are flying out and competing in these tournaments and putting all these expenses towards like a, a competitive scene. We can't just print out money and we may not have that much money to begin with in developing the game, but we can mm -hmm. provide really good content. My team, myself, we're focused on making the game that we enjoy that we want to play if it so happens that people show up and love it then that's fantastic but that's not exactly the expectation going in it's a fantastic consequence if it does happen but i i would not advise anyone to make a platform fighter with the express purpose of it popping off that is a recipe for disaster Rather than trying to become an overnight success, there's a newfound resolve towards working with players to build long-lasting communities. Modern platform fighters are putting their focus on making accessible games that are fun even if you aren't a competitive player. It's become clear that even if a release doesn't immediately bring the masses, as long as it's sustainable to do so, developers will give their support. What really helps is that we've just been around for a while. Uh, we were listening to the community while we were around for while and we didn't really have such an explosive start that it made it look like a doomsday when things died down right we truly did like if you look at steam charts and other things that tracks the player base you just see a trickle up from 50 to 500 to a thousand where people just slowly gain interest in the game there's a long-term plan for this game it's not just something that we put it out there and we're done with this uh the scope of the actual team I'd, I'd say out of necessity scales back once the game actually releases but that doesn't imply that the game is done and i don't think it should that is short term the well, the launch period of a game is chaotic it's funny it should not last as time goes on it will get more refined the meta itself will emerge in a natural way strats will come out analyses will come out it's like it's one thing to say that the development team has a long-term plan because we do it's another thing to say that the game itself inherently lends itself to being like a long-term thing because people are invested i think we've created an experience that people will want to dig into we are designing this game to expand out and try to hit as big an audience as possible not just content but like balance community tournaments it's all part of like the same kind of update structure. A lot of game studios are pretty familiar with like um, marketing and then they, they kind of consider esports to be a marketing. But for us, it's more like um, supporting the scene, like the competitive scene kind of supports that core audience, that lifeblood, that it's like a circle for us, right? So even when it comes down to prize pools and like having local events and things like that, um, we're never like doing it in a way where like, what's our return on investment? Um, it's more like, hey, what's how, how, what can we afford? What can we do to really celebrate our community and make it as big as possible? Um, because these are the same players who are then gonna go and share it with their friends. You know, definitely inspired by a game like Brawlhalla where not only is it on every console, but it's very accessible on every console, right? Like you can play it on a laptop, you can play it on your Switch, you can play it on your mobile even. Um, so that's something that's really inspiring to us long-term, but we know we have to hit you know, that high level competitive game that satisfies our audience. So that's the balancing act for us. It's um, how much do we set ourselves up to grow into this big game and then without kind of making the experience worse. Supporting like the, our player base and then the tournament scene and having a good online experience is like, that's, that's the easy answer to like what Nintendo like isn't doing basically to like you know, we 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 grew up with the with these games, playing them in the way that Nintendo didn't want us to. Making just another Smash clone is not a good idea. You need to do something more. It's actually better. It was more in our favor to focus more on the more kind of 
um, party game modes like a roguelite or the free for all stuff and items, all stuff, because that expands the, the player base. We made the foundation of the fighting game. We made sure that was fun first. We made three characters balanced against each other. And that demo is really solid. It's not up to us if this game's going to be, if a uh, combo doubles is going to be competitive or not. That's up to the people that play the game. We're going to make it a competitive game of, you know, have the, the skill curve go up and up uh, and have really deep mechanics. But if, if people just play this game and it ends up being a party mode, you know, that's up to them. But we're, we'll make it a good enough game to be competitive worthy. It's hard to have a conversation about developers supporting their communities without highlighting the complete lack of support Nintendo has offered its own. The competitive Smash community has been a grassroots scene since the game's inception, and has faced consistent pushback and restrictions from Nintendo itself. I think that people are looking for a new home because a lot of people are upset with what uh, Nintendo is doing. They just keep pushing their community down and down and down and keep hurting them more and more and more. But like, you know, when you when you think of Nintendo's perspective, this is such a small percentage of like their overall category or portfolio of games. They're making so much money outside of just this tiny little community. And like, I can totally see just them being like, yeah, we, we don't care. Like what what the Melee community, what the Ultimate community brings to the, to the table for them and their profits, like they're, they're a corporation, they're a business. And like they have like, you know, their suits and their investors and all stuff. They have people to answer to. And those people literally don't care about what's going on with the, with the tournament scene, with Melee and all that stuff. This is a contributing factor in why so many platform fighters are from independent studios. But while the flexibility and freedom from corporate control are enticing in theory, the reality of game development is a lot more complicated. Having a publisher is what, like, it, it comes with the deadlines, it comes with the potential for a, a vision to diverge from what you imagined, but with that, a game can be made. It's a trade-off a lot of people will jump into, our, our team included. I think an esports scene for a video game in this day and era is strongly dependent on developer support. So if the developers have no interest in doing an esports scene, you're likely just not going to, to, to have one in that capacity. And so when you're talking about this indie versus corporate dynamic, it's really just the people that are involved, right? You could have a really great team of people at the with the, the, the greatest backing ever and probably get something very, very successful. You just got to make sure that you have the right person with the right vision. Indy's got a little bit of charm to it. And you could argue that depending on your independent development strategies, you might be able to do more than, say, a company with more restrictions. But I think it's just a case by case basis. I'm sure if we get bigger, I think there is going to be some growing pains. So like, Everyone is always like, oh, Nintendo did this, Nintendo did that. We've come from the indie side. We really have an advantage of being like a small ship and they're a, they're the Titanic, right? So when people are like, wow, well, how come rivals can do this? And you can't because you have all this money. It's like, well, no, like we, we also have a lot less risk, right? Like we can turn, we can steer. Um, if Rivals 2 does have the big launch, there might be some things that we, we weren't even aware of that then we have to adjust. You know, I worked at Epic Games, which is half owned by Tencent. Like... Epic Games and Tim Sweeney had people to, to answer to, and they had to make a lot of hard decisions uh, based on those uh, those those shareholders and all that stuff. The support from Nintendo, it's it's definitely letting people down more and more and more, but I think the answer to that is they don't care. And it's such a small little thing to them where they don't even think about it. And so like when the community takes it that personally, uh, I understand it, but at the same time, I don't think that they understand the corporate side of, of what Nintendo thinks about it and what like is actually going on behind the scenes. The frustration towards Nintendo has fueled a growing resentment within the competitive Smash community. In their eagerness to distance themselves, some players look to new platform fighters hoping for a mass migration from Smash's esports scene. This fixation on finding some kind of Smash killer has led to expectations that exceed the scope of what smaller teams are capable of, while also going against the wishes of the developers themselves. Nintendo's full of shit. They should not be doing what they're doing. It's just embarrassing. I don't want propping up or being in a community out of spite because spite is just something I would want to avoid in a community if at all possible. You, you want everybody to be there encouraging each other, cheering each other on whenever possible. And if what one company is doing that is dumb and bullshit is your only reason for going to that other community in the first place, it will not last. That cannot last. Because the drop-off for platform fighters is so apparent, even if a game maintains a smaller dedicated player base, they're often dismissed by the scene at large. 
When you compare the subgenre of platform fighters to the overall fighting game community, there's been a distinct lack of solidarity between games. I think it's a bit weird that when you say platform fighting community, you have the Smash community, which is Ultimate and Melee, and you also have a completely separate community of like Brawlhalla and all the kind of niche fighters, the platform fighters aside from that. It's not as cohesive as it should be compared to the FGC where you're going to see the EVO top eight on Sunday have six or eight games back to back, completely different genres, uh, but a lot of similarities. So like you have MK1, you've got Strive, you've got Street Fighter 6 back to back, and those play on a fundamentally like similar structure, but they're all very different. We've kind of always taken the, the policy of like, look, we're going to be adjacent to these things, but we're not going to try and force ourselves on these things, right? Like we were at a lot of events where we were just basically like, hey, we love you guys. We're going to support you, put us in the corner because at the start we were just weren't really that big. We were just another platform fighter at the Smash events. And I was quite content with that. It, it's, it's interesting to see how we've like moved into this place where everybody talks about platform fighters. And then for some reason, someone's like, why are we talking about Brawlhalla? This exists over here. And then everybody just like kind of like looks the other way and doesn't have that conversation. That is what I've noticed has happened. But I don't really mind it because we're so, we're so strong on our own. Actually, here, here's a better way of putting it. There are melee events. There are ultimate events. There are Smash events, extraordinarily few platform fighter events. Very, very, very few will explicitly refer to them as such. Contrast that with the FGC. At, at least for larger scale, you'll rarely see, like, just a Street Fighter tournament or just a Tekken tournament outside of the very explicit, like, tournament cups. And even then, those are generally parts of other games or will feature other games. I, I think for the most part, unintentionally so, will spotlight a certain game or a certain series to such an extent that it excludes others. That exclusion means that pe people on that outside will intermingle more. If it takes years to grow a community for a single game, it'll take decades to grow a community for an entire genre. Fighting games have had that time. Dozens upon dozens of AAA and independent titles, esports legends that have made their mark in multiple communities. And as time goes on, the hope remains for a similar coexistence as platform fighters look to the future. Speaking for PM, I, I just think back to several figureheads at the time could not e even fathom it being somebody's main game. Did lend itself to an overall mood about about the game about that community where it's like okay we're we're already off brand we're already pushed off to the side might as well mingle so i look at rivals i look at dan Bernasi, and i go whoa he's awesome we, i love dan right we have uh, the joke is that we have for hall of frog in our game because very early on two indie platform fighters we wanted to get ourselves involved and that's generally been what Brawlhalla's aspect of, of, of approaching things is, is that we love all platform fighters and we want to support each other in any possible way. Do I think there needs to be a Smash Killer? No. And do I think that in the grand scheme of platform fighters, is anybody even competing to take out each other? No. There's actually so much room in the space that you could have three more successful titles come out and they're not going to affect each other. They're just going to all exist side by side with their own individual communities. The renaissance of Platform Fighters coming out right now is a very true thing. Even Bam said, like, Dan understands rising tides, uh, rise all ships. I honestly think we're in the early part of it because for two reasons. One, um, I've seen a little bit of like inklings and like whispers of some games that people want to work on, whether that's indie or bigger. Um, and I think, you know, Multiversus, Nickelodeon kind of showing that this type of fighting game just has the accessibility, like accessibility advantage over traditional fighters in my mind. You know, the fact that specials are on a button and everything is very kind of, it's intuitive, but it's also like context-based is what I really love about Smash. But the reason I think that the we're early, not only some games that I think are gonna be coming soon, but also I think something like Sakurai uh, creating a YouTube channel is a pretty big shift in our genre. You know, just these hints that have honestly taken me 15 years to kind of collect slowly over time, um, laying them out in a way that's super understandable, uh, super digestible for like someone who's just getting into game design now, you know, the kids who are 15 to 20 right now um, who are playing Ultimate and they, they've also gone back and played Melee, they've also played P+, they're gonna have the skills to just create something awesome and kind of blow 
rivals two out of the water. But like everything, you know, it's going to take time. Just as Doom Clone was used for what became first-person shooters, Smash Clone is no longer accurate to describe the emerging genre. With over 20 years of lessons learned, an ever-increasing amount of games to choose from, and a growing long-term community, platform fighters are here to stay.